Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of the New Economic Reality, an event series from the Financial Times looking at this strange new world we're living in between the COVID-19 pandemic and the major political shifts we're seeing around the globe, including here in Washington, D.C., where we're just about a week away from Election Day. My name is Lauren Fedor. I'm the FT's Washington correspondent, and I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Spiegel, the FT's U.S. Managing Editor, and Michael Peterson, the Chairman and CEO of the Peter G. Peterson Foundation for today's conversation. Peter was previously the FT's News Editor in London, and before that, he spent six years as the FT's Brussels Bureau Chief. Now he leads the FT's news operations here in the U.S., across all platforms. Michael is the chairman and CEO of the Peterson Foundation, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to addressing America's fiscal challenges. He also has a wealth of private sector experience as an entrepreneur and investor, and is a member of many organizations, including the Council on Foreign Relations and the Economic Club of New York. Just over a year ago, the FT and the Peterson Foundation joined forces to launch a monthly public opinion poll, tracking how voters felt about the economy and fiscal issues in the run up to the 2020 election. 12 months and a global pandemic later, I'm hoping that we can use the poll and its findings as a launching pad for a conversation today about how Americans are feeling about the economy and what's on the horizon when it comes to fiscal and economic policy. If you're watching this at home, please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. We also have a social media hashtag FT New Economic Reality, if you want to share your thoughts. Okay, I think with all of that out of the way, it'd be great to turn to the poll. So a question that we've asked every month since the survey started is a bit of a throwback to the 1980 presidential election. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Peter, why are we asking this question and what have the latest polls shown us? Well, thanks, Lauren. And, and I also want to say thanks to Michael, because um, when we started thinking about this, gosh, over a year ago now, I guess, um, we tried to think, how can we partner with an organization that takes economic, uh, the political debate, the like policy debate over over economics seriously? And frankly, number one, two, three in our list of potential partners was Peterson. And uh, the minute we called them up, they were excited to do it. And, and, and frankly, we wanted to be able to sort of cut away from the, the horse race polls and, and really get to the policy debate, particularly for organizations like Peterson, the FT, who care about the economic policy debate, and the fiscal policy debate. So we just thought that that was, if we could be the signature place where people came and said, you know, that classic question, are you better off than four years ago? And try to track whether voter behavior was moving in that direction. Now, funnily enough, um, I was actually s skeptical whether we'd be able to show that uh, the economics was moving voter behavior because Trump is so Trumpian, I guess, um, that I, I at least had a theory going into this that it would be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That it would be show the opposite, that people were not being driven by economics. But what we saw over the course of the pandemic, certainly over the last six, six months or so, is that Trump was riding pretty high on that key question, both, you know, are you better off than you were four years ago? But also, so the, the, the subsequent question, which we always ask is, do you think President Trump's policies have been good or bad for the economy? On both of those metrics, he was riding very high. And over the course of the last six months, we've just seen that um, support decline. And I think you've seen that in those same numbers in, in, the, in the horse race or in the job approval numbers. So although I think originally my, my hypothesis was that voters were voting on things other than the pocketbook issues and the economy, uh, what is pretty clear to me in looking at the result is that um, the right now, what is really sort of hitting Trump in the, in, in the head, head polling numbers is the fact that our FT Peterson poll shows support for uh, his economic policies and sort of the outlook personal outlook for their personal finances is really beginning to decline. Yeah, I think we've we've definitely seen at least the last couple of months uh, a real pessimistic note. No matter how we framed the question, people don't think that the recovery is coming anytime soon. Um, it's been, yeah, yeah go ahead, go Lord. ahead. I would just say that there's there's also been even you know underneath those top lines and again to more detail as we we talk, um, I brought my big stack of of cross tabs which I always like to go through. I mean the headline numbers have been interesting to watch, but what's been also interesting to watch is underneath those top lines, the various demographics changing. And the one that always stands out to me, and I know other polls that show this, has been the gender, uh, the gender gap. Because what we begin to see is, although gradual decline in 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 support and and concern about economic 
uh, issues over the course of the last six months, a real drop off among women. Um, the one I just would pull out before we, we, we turn to other things is, is if you look at, the, again, that top line question, are you better off than you were four years ago? About 40% of college educated men said they are better off, which is above the average. Our average has been about a third. So 40% say they are better off than four years ago, but 40% of, edu- of college educated women say they're worse off. So it's literally, it's a flip. And we see that throughout the data that, that, that particularly um, college educated, but also uh, white women also in particular are beginning to peel off from either their husbands or, or how you want to, to say it, um, that the men have become, been much more optimistic on, on economic issues and COVID related issues, to be honest with you, than women. And I think that's being worn out in places like Pennsylvania, which we were just talking about has, has been a huge, uh, we think is maybe a huge swing state, the Philadelphia suburbs, uh, the Pittsburgh suburbs, but other swing states where the suburban voters who may have voted for Trump last time are beginning to sort of peel off. Uh, and we're seeing that in the national polling. Yeah, and I, I think you know the economic indicators uh, are not necessarily rosy for the president either. Obviously, on the top line, but also when you again, like you point out, looking at those swing states, uh, it just so happens that some of the worst unemployment rates we're seeing in some of those midwestern states. Uh, we've seen Florida contending with huge numbers of people being laid off, especially those working in service sector and tourism and, and all the rest of it. And so all of this kind of fits together, doesn't it? Um, and and complicates it does. path to reelection. It does. And the other thing I'll just point out, um, again, in the cross tabs is is the education gap um, and the extent to which you have seen that widen, I think. And again, uh, we saw this as a factor of 2016, which is sort of non-college educated, particularly non-college educated men voting overwhelmingly for Trump. But, you know, again, th- th- this this issue of, of whether um, Trump policies have hurt or helped um, you know, we have uh, 52% of college educated men say hurt and 56% of college educated women say hurt. Um, and if you look at non-college educated men, it's the exact opposite. 58% say helped. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see that that, that that gap is widening in that you're seeing far more. Biden is, is, is gaining on what Hillary did uh, amongst the college educated uh, when mm-hmm. it comes to e- economic outlook. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, Michael, I want to bring you into the conversation because I think that um, I think we alluded to a couple minutes back, but you know, pessimism has seemingly ramped up in the last couple of months, uh, and that happens to be a period of time where Congress has been um, basically at loggerheads about economic stimulus and whether or not to extend some of those very expensive programs that were introduced earlier in the pandemic. Um, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk us through a little bit about what we've seen when it comes to federal spending in the last six, seven months, um, and, and just you know how monumental that has been, and, and what the implications you think might be uh, in terms of the the fiscal and economic picture going forward. Okay. Well, it's. Uh, I also want to thank the FT uh, for this program as well. We're very pleased with the partnership. We. I think when we set out to do this, we had no idea we would have this much going on in the world uh, to talk about and to ask Americans about. So we're really very pleased with uh, with the program. Um, it's certainly been a year full of surprises. Health, economic, and fiscal issues have never been more complicated or significant. Um, from the budget perspective, it's been a horrendous year fiscally, no, no doubt. Uh, we just hit 27 trillion uh, in terms of the total national debt. The deficit this year will will exceed $3 trillion, will be about $3.3 trillion. Um, The vast majority of that is related to the pandemic. So a little over $2 trillion of that is the emergency relief spending that went into effect over the summer. So that had a huge impact on it. But it's also important to note that that we would have borrowed a trillion dollars this year anyway without the pandemic. Uh, For us, that is the core issue we focus on, which is the continued structural deficits that exist even when you're not in a pandemic. So um, there are certain events that happen to a 2008 crisis, coronavirus, et cetera, when deficits are gonna go up and that's a natural economic phenomenon or, or emergency issue that needs spending. That's very different from the underlying structural deficits that uh, where we're continuing to borrow every, you know, every year going forward. So um, as a share of GDP, that's how you often look at debt. Unfortunately, uh, that's accelerated significantly. So when before the pandemic, we were looking at the US reaching 100% debt to GDP 10 years from now, we're gonna hit that this year. So we've basically lost 10 years of running room on our debt problem. That was an issue we thought was urgent before, but it's obviously now more urgent. Uh, But we gotta remember we're in the middle of a pandemic. So 
now is not the time to, to deal with our long run deficit problem, but the minute this crisis is over, we're going to have to turn ourselves back to those issues. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what you, I know that you were very focused on not only identifying the problem, but also identifying solutions or potential solutions to this problem. Um, and what I thought, you know, we asked consistently, again, it was one of those questions we returned to month after month. And the poll seemed to suggest that uh, there was overwhelming uh, support from voters left, right, and center. You asked them, should America be fiscally responsible? Should we balance our federal budget? Everyone seems to say yes. Um, but then there seems to be a, a great deal of disagreement about how to do that and, and differing appetites for uh, tax rises or spending cuts. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you see the path forward there. Well, I think uh, there's remarkable consistency on this issue. So we run something every month outside of this program called the Fiscal Confidence Index. And you're right, people are very concerned about this. They, they have been for a long time. Uh, more than 80% of participants in that survey want the president and Congress to spend more time addressing this issue. So it's a, it's a grave concern. And throughout this, uh, this survey we did, that was certainly a consistent approach. Certainly Americans are gonna differ on how to do it. Um, uh, there's no doubt about that. Your ideology and your view of government and your, your personal outlook is certainly impacts how you wanna do it. But I think, I think it is clearly a priority. I, although there's, there's some unity in this. So we asked, um, once the pandemic is over, how important is it to you that the next president ensure that his spending priorities are paid for so they don't increase the deficit? 94% said that it's important. So there is a lot of unity around the importance of this issue, but even, even within the solutions, uh, there was up, upwards of 80 to 90% on some of the issues we asked about in terms of uh, closing tax loopholes, raising the corporate tax rate, things like that did generate majorities of support. So. Um, when the time comes, there, you know, there will be people rallying around trying to do something about this because I think they realize that uh, this pandemic has accelerated this problem significantly. Mm. Well, we, I, this is a good time to point out that we have some questions coming in from the audience. So if you're watching and you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A and I'll try to get to them as we, as we go. Um, you know, listening to you speak, Michael, one of the things that um, kind of came to mind for me in my job as a political reporter uh, is I find when I'm talking to voters and they talk about fiscal responsibility, particularly older voters are very worried about Social Security. They're worried about Medicare. They're worried about all these entitlements that they feel as though they paid into for a very long time. And what if what if the pot runs dry and it's not there for them uh, when they thought it was going to be? Um, and, and, you know, I think that comes up, like I said, especially with older voters, uh, with seniors. And, and I'm wondering, Peter, um, if you have any thoughts about kind of how the two candidates have have been trying to appeal to those older voters. We've definitely seen some polling that shows that this is a real problem area for the president. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and why it might matter come next week. Yeah, so obviously when, actually it was, it was in March, I think we started this, we said, oh gosh, this, this, this pandemic thing looks like it might be pretty bad. And we started asking behavioral questions uh, related to the pandemic. And uh, we built that up again in April. And we've been asking those questions again consistently throughout the last uh, six, seven months. And as you say, Lauren, there is clearly in terms of, the, the two main questions we follow there is, do you think uh, the, the pandemic is getting better or worse in your, in your local community? And do you think that, um, the, the restrictions on, on business and social dis distancing should be lifted in the next uh, three three months or or longer. Um, and on all of those questions, the, the the there is an age gap, whereas the older voters are more concerned about that in general than younger voters. Um, and as a result, and I think we've seen this in sort of again the head-to-head -head polling, like for instance, Florida, um, when the there is a spike in cases in Florida, we start seeing the 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 numbers decline for Trump. And so I think it, it's Florida is an older state, and I think a lot of older voters are responding to that. Um, I think that's a real key one. The other thing on, on, on COVID while we're, we're on the topic uh, that really jumps out at me is, is the African-American vote. Um, it has been an outlier almost throughout here. And so we've seen sort of, you know, a general, as per usual with, with, with things political in the U.S., it's been a pretty 50-50 nation um, with regards to Trump economic policies and, and whatnot. But it is, when you look at the numbers, the real anger, and again, obviously in, in the age of, of Black Lives matter, um, the real outlier that the African-American community is both on economics and on on COVID is really, really striking. And again, if you, if you'll uh, indulge me, I just think a couple 
data points on this. You know, if you look at, again, the better off, worse off thing, um, 51% of African-Americans say they're worse off than four years ago. Again, the, the, the national average is 30%. So huge, huge gap there between the national average and African-Americans. Um, and only 8% say they're better off. I mean, I think that's, that's pretty stunning when you think about um, that, that voting block. Um, you know, we also, although we say, we, we ask the question, you know, or we report the question on, are you, is Trump policies better or worse uh, for the economy? We actually ask the question, do you think it's somewhat better, somewhat worse? a lot better, a lot worse. African-Americans say a lot that it strongly hurt the economy. 58% of black men, 60% of black women say it strongly hurt the economy. And that is really stunning. Um, on, on, on COVID, the topic you asked, Lauren, you know, will the outbreak get better or worse in your community in the next, in the next month? 64% of black men say worse. Uh, overall percent, 48 percent. Social distancing, should it, should it should it last longer than three months? 88 percent of African-Americans say it should last longer than three months to 65 percent of the overall numbers. That just to me is a really stunning result. And it gets to this issue of voter turnout. You know, we've seen the long lines in Atlanta. We've seen the long lines in Philadelphia. You know, if the African-American vote turns out this time in the way they didn't four years ago, uh, they did for Obama, uh, but didn't show up really four, uh, four years ago. I think that also could have a huge implication because what is clear from our poll is both on COVID and on the economy, um, there's a lot of real strong pessimism about the direction of the country right now. Yeah, and, and, and you're absolutely right. It gets at that question of whether or not people have trust and confidence in their leadership, whether they think it's, it's worth voting at all. Um, and I know you've been doing some reporting in Philadelphia when we talk about key swing states where the margins were just so small last time around. Uh, turnout, even on the edges in cities like Philadelphia, like Detroit, like Milwaukee, um, those could certainly make a huge difference. In addition to the South, like you say, Atlanta, which is all of a sudden very much, Georgia is very much a swing state. Um, Joe Biden's going to be going there tomorrow. So, you know, it's, it's it gets so many it, more states are in play than they were. But it ago. also gets to the theory of the case here. And I think sometimes in 2016, there has been one narrative that's come out of there, which is the rise of the angry white male, essentially, and the, the, the turnout uh, that, that went for Trump. And I think when you drill down the numbers, there, OK, there was a case for that. If you look at at, at Trump 2016 versus for, certainly Obama's first run for president, where where uh, the Obama coalition existed, there were a lot of working class whites who peeled off from the Obama coalition to go for Trump. But I think the, 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 to me, the, the other narrative, which gets less reporting, is the lack of turnout amongst the Democratic base for Hillary Clinton. And so much of that is the African-American vote in you know the big industrial northern states and also in North Carolina and Georgia, which are also um, uh, you know key, key swing states this time around. And what we know about Biden from the primary is he won the nomination based on the African-American vote, starting in South Carolina through Super Tuesday. And again, just looking at our data, you know, if that if, if that if that electorate is motivated, they are so angry right now at, at, the, at the state of the economy and at the state of, of, of COVID response. I think that could be pretty decisive in those states we're talking about. Mm, yeah, I think, I think you're definitely right. Um, I want to kind of- it, uh, it also surprised me at somehow the level of consistency of, of the results though, right? I mean, if you had said to me a year ago, okay, we're going to have the deepest downturn in the economy in the history of America, we're going to have the employment unemployment rate more than double. We're going to have tens of million people lose their job. And those saying they're better off, worse off will be approximately the same. I mean, it's roughly a third better off, a third worse off, and a third about the same. You know, compared to November, the numbers are almost identical, uh, November last year. So, you know, you're right. Uh, people are concerned about the economy within the crosstabs. I'm sure there's communities that are more effective than others. Uh, but overall, that's been given what we've been through. It's much steadier than I would have predicted. Uh, it's true, and frankly, it's the same thing when you look at the equity markets, right? Why is it again with historically bad GDP numbers that the, the stock market keeps going up? And and, and it, I think this is something that. I mean, we've been waiting for that crack in the economy to happen, right? We were th thinking, okay, the fiscal stimulus has run out, you know, in the summer, people are starting to to not be able to pay their rent checks. If the rent checks is not paid, does the landlord not be able to pay his mortgage? Does that filter back to the financial system because suddenly all these non-performing loans show up on the books of, of big financial institutions? But we keep waiting for that to happen, and it hasn't happened. So you're right, Michael. It's been one of the sort of the the the, the, the dog that didn't bark, for lack of a better word, in our own reporting because we keep waiting for that moment where either the economy 
goes off the rails, or as you say, public opinion begins to really shift against against the the, the economy. And it hasn't happened. We've seen marginal shifts, as I said at the outset, gradual decline in support for ec- the president's economic policy, gradual, uh, you know, feeling worse off. But it hasn't been, as you say, given the the the, the, the scale of the crisis, you haven't seen a hugely sharp drop off in 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 economic uh, uh, outlook. Yeah. Well, I think I think the investment markets are a little different from public opinion. I think there's two main factors that have contributed to that, in my opinion. One is the Fed coming in and providing a lot of liquidity. So they came in very large, very significantly, very quickly, and people knew there was going to be liquidity there. So these companies were going to were going to be able to weather through. Also, when you're when you're valuing a business, you tend to look over the long run and you discount cash flows back. And I think most people understand this is a this is a major issue, but it's somewhat temporary. Uh, we will have a vaccine. We will have treatments uh, in the relatively near future. So, if you're looking at a company over five to ten years, you know, does this does this diminish the value? Sure, but if it if it bounces back, uh, you know, you can make up a lot of that. Within public opinion, you don't always see that. They're not. Always, they're thinking, how am I feeling right now? Uh, and that to me, that was even more remarkable that it, it was that steady. When we look at the um, time horizons and when a recovery might happen. When it comes to the voters who, as you rightly point out, have a very different time horizon and conception of these things than, than investors do, you know, sometimes there's overlap, but, but generally speaking, um, the voters seem to be pushing back that recovery date. Uh, when we first started asking the question, uh, we had much higher figures saying that it, the recovery would happen within a year. And now with every passing month, the number of people saying it's going to take more than a year uh, only increases. And yet, you know, we're plowing closer and closer to that year. And Michael, earlier on, you talked about kind of uh, when this is all behind us is the time to address the fiscal situation. And I'm wondering when you think it it will be behind us and when that when that time might be. I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Um, I think I I would just make the relatively obvious point that the health crisis is inextricably linked to the economic crisis until we have real treatments and real vaccines that are in widespread use you know, the economy is just not going to come back to where it was. And even then, it's going to take some number of years to get back to where we would have been, at least on our on our growth path. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's good news, bad news. The bad news is we got to wait. The good news is I think the recovery will be there, right? I mean, when you go through a financial crisis like 2008, I don't think you can point to any event that says, okay, when this happens, every, it's going to be over. On this health crisis, the good news is, you know, we have some timeline that we can look to where this is over. Um, at that point, we're going to have to see how, how, how bad the economy is. If, if, uh, if it's a very slow recovery, it's going to take more time and, and we're going to need more fiscal policies, policy to support folks. Um, but as it recovers, we're going to have to turn our attention back to this issue. But I, I can't give you a date, but you know, I would think sometime during next year, we should have this, have this relatively behind us, uh, at least from the health standpoint. I mean, I would just say, to add to Michael's point, I, I'll be interested as a reporter to watch that debate play out in Washington, because I think it's going to be key thing to watch about when that we we turn to a more normal debate about fiscal, but also, frankly, watching the Republican Party on this, because, you know, up until uh, Trump was president, the 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 rump, particularly in the the House, uh, was a Republican Party was a real fiscal hardline group of, of, of legislators who really um, was worried about spending and, and worried about the, 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 the debt to GDP ratio and on all these things that Michael's been talking about. And clearly that wing of the Republican Party has been very, very silent for four years as Trump has sort of, you know, worked not only on, on yeah, pick, pick an issue, tariff, you know, on China, but then subsidizing farmers and, and, and you know, sort of opening the spigots in almost a, a sort of a almost an old fashioned democratic kind of way, whether the Republican Party returns to its roots and really takes this issue of uh, fiscal responsibility seriously. And, and frankly, I think that's been a, helpful to them in the elections, because as Michael says, there's consistently polling that shows the American people in general want their government to be fiscally responsible and want smaller government and, and lower taxes. And that used to be the Republican Party brand. And, and I think they've gotten away from that slightly. Um, but back to your question on, on the timing of this, I think the interesting thing to me is, again, sort of riffing on what Michael was saying, that on, on the economy, as Michael said, there hasn't been a huge amount of, of difference over the last six to seven months versus where it was in no- November. Uh, again, a lot of partisan differences. If you're Republican, you tend to think that you're better off than you were four years ago. If you're, de- if you're Democrat, you tend to think you're worse off. Um, and so that has not been surprising. and That hasn't really changed. One thing that, that jumped out at me on COVID, and I think it's why you've seen Biden really hammer this this issue and why Trump complaining about it over the last 24, 48 hours is independence. Independence are much more pessimistic than your average voter um, 
uh, on how long it's going to take to recover from COVID. And I think that's where uh, Biden sees some some room to move here. And, and I think, frankly, why you get to hit signals about from the Trump campaign that want to try to change the topic. Um, you know, the overall number of Republicans who think it's going to get uh, worse off in their community is 30 percent. Uh, but 50 percent of independents say they think it's going to get worse off. So that, that to me, really stuck out as, as an area where the partisan lines are are beginning to blur or, or get mixed up a little bit. Um, those independents are really, really worried about the, 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 how long this is going to take. And again, as you said, Lauren, what we've seen is that after a brief sort of summer uh, increase in, in optimism, it's really gotten pessimistic and even more pessimistic now than it was back in March or April. Um, so that's, I think that's really hanging over, over, the, over, the, over the campaign right now. Yeah, I think you're right. And as Michael aptly pointed out, uh, the health crisis and the economic crisis are intrinsically linked. Um, and you know, who's to say what's going to happen in the coming weeks and months as it gets colder. And we've obviously already seen spikes in a, in a fair number of states, um, hospitalizations up and, and how that kind of interplay. There are people in different parts of the country, I think, who who went back to work or started getting back to some level of normalcy. And, and we could see a, a pulling back again, even if, you know, Joe Biden says he won't shut down the economy. And Trump obviously is, is pushing ahead with with reopening. Um, we, we could see more twists and turns, I'm sure, um, between now and, and the end of the year. Um, I, I wanted to uh, kind of take us again to an area where there actually seems to be a bit of consensus, um, and it, it's in terms of uh, tax plans. Uh, I know that we've asked about people's appetite for raising taxes on the wealthy, increasing the corporate tax rate. Uh, these are things that um, are certainly the Democrats are trying to campaign hard on but it seems as though it's actually one of these areas where there may be maybe more agreement um, than than there are in other areas. And I, I don't know, Michael, if, if if you have any views on that. Yeah, well, I, I was uh, I found that quite remarkable, the level of agreement on that. So so we asked them uh, about solutions to improving the debt situation. Uh, support for closing tax loopholes was 89 percent. I mean, that's that's across both parties, obviously. Um, we have about $1.5 trillion annually of what are called tax expenditures. So those are tax breaks, loopholes, deductions, et cetera. That exceeds what we collect in income taxes, actually. So, I mean, we have a huge amount of these permanent fixtures within the tax code that decrease our revenue. So a lot of people are focused on those. Uh, raising taxes on those with higher incomes, that got 80%. So you certainly hear a lot of that on the Democratic side, much less of that on the public side. But within the within the, the populace, there are people supporting it from both sides. Uh, cracking down on the tax tax evasion, that's always a high number, 86 percent. Um, raising the corporate tax rate, 71 percent. So that's a pretty significant more, uh, majority for an issue that was just really dealt with uh, legislatively just a couple of years ago. Uh, national sales tax, very, you know, 40 percent. So that was something people don't want to add. A, I think a new version of a tax that hits everybody on their day to day spending. Uh, but in some of these other areas, there's more support than you might think, you know, listening to the political conversation. Uh, and I think whoever the president is, there's an opportunity there. I mean, the fact is, when you have 94 percent of the people saying they want to pay for it, significant majorities from both parties saying they're willing to do these things, 80 plus percent saying this is a priority, you know, uh, a president who wants to lead on this issue is going to have support. Do you have a view on on raising the corporate tax rate and whether or not that would be you know, a net positive for the fiscal picture or whether or not it, it creates too many stumbling blocks or, you know. Well, it's a complex it's issue. We, we tend to promote fiscal responsibility in general and try to leave it up to Congress to work out the details and specific tax, rate, tax rates. I will say we were very disappointed with the fact that the 2017 tax legislation added $2 trillion to the debt. Uh, there were, the first version put out by the House Budget Committee uh, was revenue neutral because they made a lot of changes that were smart and they added some new revenue in different areas. And, and we, we worked with the tax policy center. We had 10 or 12 different ways to make it budget neutral or revenue neutral. So we were certainly disappointed but by the fact that at the end of the day, it added $2 trillion to our debt. And again, in a very strong economy with low unemployment, good economic growth. I mean, this was not the time uh, to, to reduce revenues. It was a time to actually collect more revenues for you know, for the next rainy day, which you know certainly happened this year. So, um, uh, but there's a lot of things you can do with the tax code that it seems like most Americans are, are quite open to. 
Peter, we have a question that's come in and it may be from one of our FT global readers doing some sort of cross country comparison, but they're interested in the concept of taxing wealth uh, rather than assets. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, or not, you know, um, they uh, liken wealth taxes versus estate taxes versus gift taxes, but I'm wondering what, what you make of, of wealth taxation and, and whether or not that A, exists in America, because some people would probably argue it does, um, and B, what the merits or, or drawbacks would be of that. Well, I think you have it right. You know, the, the inheritance tax is probably the, the place where you have what is closest to a a, um, uh, a wealth tax in the U.S. Now, this came up, frankly, from my old life in in, in Brussels uh, during the eurozone crisis, particularly in Italy, um, where they were there was some rumbling that they're considering a half percent or even less than that uh, tax on on household wealth across the board. And the Italians have actually done this before, um, and have have. You know, in order to play down debt and, and to make sure that their 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 bond yields uh, start coming down because they were very very high at the time this was going on and there was worried that there would be uh, would be able to finance their their sovereign debt for a while. The problem that that wealth tax throws up is though I always find is is, is almost insurmountable. Um, you know, in Italy they always talk about people putting cash in suitcases and, and going across the border to Switzerland. I mean, in the age of of of, of you know virtual m money. They'd be able to actually say what 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 people's net wealth is and then actually attach a tax to it. Um, I think is is just is too hard. Uh, I also think politically in the U.S. that's just not something that is that is politically palatable. We tend not to punish wealth. I mean, for, for to be to to be bumper stickery about it. Um, it. It's sort of against the American ethos. Um, you know, we tax capital, we tax labor, but taxing wealth, I think, is probably a, a bridge too far. So I don't think that's necessarily uh, something that's going to happen. You've seen, you know, in some state and local jurisdictions, things like a mansion tax. Uh, you know, the the, the, the New Jersey has just adopted uh, a tax on millionaires. So you do have things that are, at least have a populist appeal in that regard. But um, they tend to, you know, New Jersey's facing this thing where, you know, a lot of people who are you know, in the financial services industry here in the New York area saying, well, I'll just going to pick up and, and move to Florida because if you're going to tax me at that rate in New Jersey or even in New York, I can go to a, to a, to a low tax jurisdiction and work virtually. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that those kinds of things become a bit bit of a competitive disadvantage to a lot of these states if they start going that direction. Yeah, we had that story last week, didn't we, about Elliot relocating operations to Florida and to Connecticut and what the implications might be if, if others follow for the New York tax base. Yeah, I mean, they're not they're not the only one. We've seen a lot of actually even even before COVID, um, we saw you know after the after the as, as the, the 2017 uh, tax legislation, which made it you know uncompetitive to do certain things in the big uh, urban high tax urban areas. Um, you started seeing that gradual move, and, and it's only it's only picked up, frankly. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think most Americans would would find it more palatable to make minor adjustments to the existing tax code rather than wholesale changes. You saw that with the, with the sales tax piece. A value-added tax gets a lot of support around the world, but Americans tend to hesitate on that. A wealth tax would be a totally different form of tax on assets that were already taxed in the first place. So I think they're very comfortable with more, more taxes. I mean, uh, you know, the polling that, that I mentioned earlier, and there's no doubt we need more revenue. Um, over the next 10 years, we're going to spend 22.5% of GDP and collect 17 and a half percent of GDP. I mean, that's that's the definition of unsustainable. So the, it's got to come from somewhere. Uh, and I think there is support for higher taxes on the wealthy, uh, but a wealth tax specifically, I think might might get a lot of resistance. Yeah, I mean, talking to you, it's actually, uh, it, it uh, calls to mind for me some of the reporting I did earlier in, in the pandemic, but is still ongoing. Uh, this kind of difference between how states and cities are forced to balance their budgets in America, whereas the federal government isn't. Um, and you'd have these conversations with, with uh, people at the state and local level who are, who are making these tough decisions and recognizing, as you say, that the money has to come from somewhere. And then they're looking to Washington where I am and saying, well, you know, if we can do it, you can do it. And there's actually quite a bit of headbutting between these, these state governors and, and the congressional delegations of over pr spending priorities. And I, I don't think... They haven't reached consensus yet. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, the good news is, is is we can do this, right? I mean, of all the issues that are tough, I mean, creating a vaccine immediately is not so easy. <laughs> Dealing with the Middle East, the climate change. I mean, there's so many global challenges that are, are very difficult to solve. The budget issue is entirely within our control. There's a few hundred people in Washington that could make these adjustments quite easily. We know all the ways to do it. We just got to come up with a solution. So that, you know, that's the good news. 
And it's, it's, it's sometimes feels like it's insurmountable, right? It's 27 trillion, it's $100 trillion of, of, of deficits over the next uh, few decades. Um, but the adjustments we need are only about 2.9% of GDP. So if we just do a little bit gradually, you know, you can, you can address this structural problem over time. And I'm not saying that's a small amount of money, it certainly is, but I think we can do this without changing the American way of life, for example. And, and as you said earlier, Social Security is a critical program for many Americans. Do we think it really makes sense for that to be on the path to insolvency in a relatively short period of time? I mean, I think voters are concerned about it, as they should be. I think you're right, Michael, but just to play slightly devil's advocate here, because I get slightly depressed sometimes when I see the polling numbers on this, because you do see overwhelming support for fiscal responsibility in Washington, paying down the debt, bringing the deficit under control. And yet, you know, the question we kept asking, do you need more fiscal stimulus? It was, you know, 90 percent people said yes. So it's one of those things that, that, that maybe we're in a particular time right now that obviously the fiscal stimulus takes priority over over uh, debt reduction. But I guess my concern about this always is, you know, cut other people's programs, don't cut mine. And whether, and that also complicates uh, the politics of this, right? You know, it dates back to, you know, the showdown at Gucci Gulf, right? You know, back in uh, Dan Rostenkowski tried to push this through the Ways and Means Committee and and was really punished by by uh, senior voters uh, over any real attempt to, to tackle it, the debt and deficit problems. And I think, you know, my nervousness, I guess, about this, and frankly, why your work is so important, is a lot of this is about political communication. You know, there's tends to be, as you say, a general support nationwide for this, but having people to realize it, it requires difficult trade-offs that, you know, and, and to share the pain, sometimes it's not easy to do politically. And I think your organizations like Peterson's important in that, but also I think, you know, you need to have a critical mass in Washington cross-party, bipartisan groups that don't really exist in Washington these days. You used to have it when I first arrived in Washington back in the 90s, where you had, you know, in, in the Clinton White House and in, in, in sort of moderate Republicans in Capitol Hill, so these groups that would get together and try to sort hash these things these things out. Um, and you just don't see with the passing of John McCain and and, and some of the, the, the hyper-partisanship that has happened over the last four years. I just wonder whether there is that bipartisan sharing of pain, willingness to, to, to get at it, because it will take some pain on, on both sides. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And I don't mean to diminish the political difficulty around some of these, these policy changes. Uh, um, but I think what, what you're talking about is leadership, right? I mean, if, if we know this needs to happen, we know this is not okay. We know there's support for this generally among the populace. Uh, we know exactly how to do this. Uh, what you need is leadership and leadership on both sides to come together and say, you know, for the richest nation on earth, 27 trillion in debt makes no sense. We all have kids and grandkids that we love and want to support to continue to take money that is essentially taking away from them. There's a moral question there. America has, America has always been about the future and leaving the next generation better off. And here we are, again, pandemic aside, this is a, a multi-trillion dollar problem that we're dealing with. But again, before this, we, we were going to borrow a trillion dollars this year. Does that make sense? And is that consistent with our values? And I think most people would say no. So what you need is leadership in Washington to make that case and present it. And you mentioned the tax reform in the 80s. I mean, that got 96 votes, I think, in the Senate. You know, so it's possible that was in the 80s, but uh, uh, we need a, we need another round of things like that to bring the country together. Well, you know, I, I might see things a little bit glass half full too much of the time, but I would say that you know, covering congressional politics, uh, there's certainly lots of disagreement. But I actually think the budget process in Washington, the appropriations process, is actually still in these hyperpartisan environment one of the more bipartisan processes that still remains on Capitol Hill. You do see, um, I think, mostly those people sitting down in good faith and trying to hash out agreements, um, even if there are too many continuing resolutions and, and all sorts of kind of band-aids rather than structural fixes to some of these, these problems and questions. Um, and I also think it's, it's worth kind of questioning, you know, we all know we're a week out from the election and the next Congress could look very, very different. The next White House could look very, very different. Um, but I think whether or not the president is reelected or uh, Joe Biden becomes president, there will definitely be uh, shifts, I think, in the way that a lot of these people in Washington operate. I think on the Republican side, even if the president is reelected, you'll have people positioning themselves for their own political futures. And all of a sudden, uh, they might be willing to, to step out on a limb um, in a way that they, they currently aren't willing to. And I think on the Democratic side too, even if we look at 
you know, there's a lot of discussion and expectation among the Democrats, those who feel really optimistic that they can take the White House and the Senate. Uh, you know, there is a version of that which involves the Democrats just pushing through whatever they want. But I think that could potentially expose huge fissures within that own party. Um, you know, we forget, but two years ago, uh, the Democrats flipped the House with a lot of moderates in districts where big spending programs, very liberal agenda is not popular. Um, and I think we could see, I don't know, maybe I'm, again, I'm just too optimistic, but I think we could actually see uh, common ground reemerging. But, you know, famous last words, this will be played back against me in two years when the government's shut down or something. Um, let's see, we have quite a few other questions coming in. Um, one of which I think probably we've already you know, touched on in different ways, but people are saying, given the polling results, if you were advising a future administration, whether that's another Trump administration or the Biden administration, what lessons do you think they should be learning uh, from the FT Peterson poll? What should they be keeping in mind? Um, well, see, that's where maybe I, I, I'm a little bit more pessimistic. I mean, you know, because I think it tells us two different things. I think it tells us that people are very worried about the level of debt but I also think it says that people are still really hurting and feel the need for more fiscal st stimulus. And, uh, you know, again, get to back to Michael's, you know, the question you asked Michael, which is when this is, when, when does this, when does the thing end, I guess? Um, I think we need to watch that very carefully because I think there has to come a time where there is no more fiscal stimulus and we start focusing on, on debt reduction again. And is that six months, 12 months, 18 months? I, I don't know when it is, but it's going to be driven by politics. To, to your point about, about, you know, uh, the, the, both Democrats and Republicans, whether they begin to focus on this once uh, the election happens. It was interesting to me, just as a canary in the coal mine kind of thing, Ted Cruz, who has long been sort of the big, uh, you know, one, one of the biggest sort of fiscal hawks on, in Washington, just in the last week started saying, you know, we might have to start paying attention to this, uh, where he's been sort of silent for four years. So in, in that sense, maybe you'll start seeing these sort of, you know, the, the people who, who care about this issue more, voicing more support for it. Um, I still think it's too early. But again, I guess that maybe why, you know, in terms of recommending to the next president what to do, I worry slightly if you rely on our poll, um, it's going to tell you conflicting things. It's going to tell you that the more people want, they do want you know, more taxes on the rich, they want more stimulus, they want to, you know, to, to cut spending, but they want, they want more spending. Um, and it makes it very, very difficult for, to, to pr 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 present a coherent policy platform, which again, gets back to, to Michael's point, which is, it's about leadership and political communication. If you have a leader who says, um, I know you're hurting, but look, we're passing on this debt to our, to our children, you know, we'll do this one last stimulus, but then we got to start thinking about the debt. I think that's going to be key to whoever becomes president in, in uh, January 20th. Well, yeah, I, I would just add to that. I think I think one key takeaway is that Americans are smart. I mean, they get it. They understand what's going on with this health crisis. They understand what's going on with the economy. They understand our, our fiscal future is in jeopardy. And I think they're more receptive to leadership than people tend to think, right? They're worried about the next election. They don't want to say anything about anything that might be difficult. But these these Americans are, are doing a good job handling the situation and communicating their views, you know, at least in this format. And and to me, there's not, it may sound like there's a, a, a disagreement, but to be pro the relief effort and pro fiscal responsibility, I think those things are consistent, actually. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We've got a huge unemployment. This is a temporary health crisis where we've got to invest in, in the solution. At the same time, we have a long-term fiscal challenge that we've got to deal with. And, you know, the way we asked the question, you know, elucidated both of those points of view. And I, you know, I think those they are inconsistent, like if you're measuring the level of debt, but in terms of a strategy, it makes sense. Deal with this crisis, and after that, deal with our debt problems. So to me, uh, uh, I'm, I'm continuously reminded how much people understand about these issues. Yeah, and, and if, as you know, Peter was talking about political communication, both of you have been talking about that. If you have a clear message to voters that we're all in this together, and this is what we need to do in, to, in order to get to where we wanna go, um, you, can, you can have buy-in. Um, I think, Peter, when you talk about the kind of uh, concern about people letting go of, of these programs, one thing that I've found very interesting and I understand is very politically complex to explain to people is whether or not these programs are going to be phased out. And if so, how is the phase out going to work? And how do you convey that to people in a way that they you know, are understanding and, and receptive to rather than the faucets on and then the faucets off? Um, and I know yeah. we've seen some European countries kind of playing around with that idea, too, of creating some sort of sliding scale or trying to figure out how to tackle that. 
Yeah, I guess there's two ways to look at this question. I mean, frankly, because there's been no fiscal stimulus since basically the summer, we've already seen sort of a phasing out de facto. Um, so people are having to adjust to that. But as Michael said, I think there's, there's the two ways to look at it is the, the programs that are being you know funded through fiscal stimulus now that will, I think everyone agrees, will have to end at some point. But there is pre, again, pre-COVID structural issues there that were added to by the, by the, the 2017 tax uh, legislation, but it, frankly existed even before that, uh, that have not been tackled. And I think those, those questions are, are, are tougher to deal with. The insolvency of Social Security, um, these the sort of these, 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 so much of what is wrong or difficult in terms of the structural deficit are ongoing entitlement programs that would have to be reformed uh, in some way. And doing that is, is just very, very politically costly. And, and trying to you know, convince your average American that, okay, we, we might have to raise a threshold on, on or means test to a certain extent some of these benefits um, and to make that a nuanced argument, um, it always gets uh, politically um, uh, demagogued. And I, I think I think Michael's right in that it, it, it takes leadership, but boy, it's really, really hard. And, and for a new president, I think they have to decide that this is one of the two or three things they're just going to push. You know, what we saw with Obama was he got through health care and uh, didn't really get there with, with uh, you know, with financial services reform, did a bit, not, not a whole lot. And that was basically it until the Congress switched parties and he didn't get a huge amount uh, through after that. You know, Clinton was NAFTA and some of the trade issues and, and tax reform. Uh, if there's only one or two or three big things that, that a president can do. So I think if, if, if either a reelected Trump or a, or, or a new President Biden were to come in and say, I am going to put a lot of muscle and political capital into entitlement reform, I think we can move the dial, but I think without that, um, I think it's very, very difficult to get done. Yeah, Michael, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on the timing there about whether or not, just given the political realities, it's kind of a now or never, it's gotta be early in any administration. Well, I think Peter's right. I mean, this is this is incredibly difficult politically. Uh, it's a vicious political system where, you know, the minute you propose something slightly difficult, the other side will use it against you. Um, I think it, it's, we're gonna have to just have to see what the moment is like. Uh, um, you know, in the eighties, we talked about that example. They, they came together and solved it and you had real leadership, Reagan, Tip O'Neill and things, you know, the, uh, Dan Roskomkowski and others came together. So it's all sitting there ready to go. The question is, is there a moment where people can come together and do this? And um, I've always felt that the, the trillions being added so quickly will raise the issue back into the fold, right? And uh, when you hit 27, hit 30 trillion, you know, it's, it does garner people's concern um, during the financial crisis, even though, again, that was not the right time to inject fiscal reform. People got very concerned about the rising deficit. We hit a trillion and a half in 2009. That was a dramatic increase. So, you know, we'll just have to see what moment presents itself. Uh, you know, I think the next president is going to have a lot to deal with, no matter who they are. Uh, and I'm not predicting that Social Security reform will happen on day, you know, day one. Um, but these issues are growing in importance. They're people, as the poll shows, it's on people's minds. And, um, you know, there are issues that can bring people together. And this, this could be one of them. We only have a, a couple of minutes left. Um, and I know that uh, you both have kind of nodded to this, but one of the viewers is asking, uh, what has surprised you most over the 12 months of the FT Peterson poll? And obviously there have been a lot of surprises in 2020, but I'm wondering if, if maybe just briefly um, before we wrap things up, each of you might want to pull out one thing that uh, was maybe a bit counterintuitive to you or uh, you were not expecting to find out about the electorate that you did through this, through this exercise. Well, let me cheat a little bit, Lauren, and, and do two things. Um, the, the, the first thing I would say is, Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised by this, but the continued partisanship on how people view the economy has really been striking to me. And we tried to be clever about this, right? We asked two separate questions, which is one was, has Donald Trump's policies helped or hurt the economy, which we thought would elicit a partisan response. And then we asked, are you better off than you were four years ago, which we thought, you know, and we, we phrased it, I think, in a way, are your personal finances better off or, or, or worse off? And we thought that would, that would sort of allow people to sort of put their partisan thinking in, in their back of their brain and think more about their day to day, you know, how their finances are. But what it showed was that 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 partisanship is coloring everything. And and again, maybe I should be surprised by that. You know, frankly, if you go 
watch the NFL these days, it's partisan. Uh, it's become political, politicized. If you send your kid to school or not, it's become politicized. You know, our whole life has become politicized. So maybe I shouldn't have been surprised by that. But that was that was surprising uh, to me that, that, that how deep the, the partisan fissures went when it comes to the view of the economy. And it sort of belied any reality of the economic realities on the ground. The other thing I'll just say, just because looking ahead to election day, what I guess surprised me on the upside is we started asking about a month or two ago, do you have faith in the electoral system? Um, do you think that the, the vote will be counted fairly? Uh, do you think the mail-in voting will be counted fairly? Uh, these kinds of things, as obviously the president has raised this issue and given COVID, we wanted to see whether people um, still had faith. And overwhelmingly, and again, across party lines, mostly across race, gender, all this, thing, the vast majority of Americans, in many cases, 75% of the Americans still have faith that the, the votes will be counted fairly. So that was, I think, really quite heartening. Now, there were some partisan differences there. I think if you look at a Republic, registered Republicans, self-identified Republicans, that number begins to come down a little bit in terms of the fair counting. But overwhelmingly still, the majority of people said they trust in the mail-in voting system. They trust their votes will be counted safe, uh, uh, correctly and, and accurately. And so I think that was, that was quite heartening and, and frankly, a bit of a surprise for me uh, going into election day. Michael, anything that uh, caught you by surprise? Do you know it all? It's, uh, it's mostly what I said earlier, despite the huge changes in our economy, the level of consistency of people's responses to their current condition. Uh, I wouldn't have expected that. And even though the partisanship that is a constant in our country and, and Peter's right about that, I would have thought there'd be more changes given, given just the turmoil that we're all have been going through and, and continue to go through. Uh, and on, on the positive, the 94% of people thinking the next president should, should pay for their priorities. I thought that was a very encouraging sign for people's understanding that, that we got to get our fiscal house in order. So, um, anyway, thank you both for, for uh, a great 12 months worth of polls. Very well, interesting. Time. We all learned a lot. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to thank you and Peter, uh, for participating. Um, and then just remind people who are watching as we wrap up. Uh, that this webinar will be available on demand for a month. So if you have any friends who you think might enjoy watching it, you can send it and share it to, with them. Um, and uh, there will be future new economic reality events announced soon. So if you keep an eye on the FT website, which I'm sure all of you do for breaking news uh, and analysis, uh, those events will be advertised there as well. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, guys.